God's grace. Now, I've had the privilege this week uh, to do a few uh, a Bible study with a an individual. Uh, his father is, is a, a, a newly member of Forest's Beach Church, and and so I've been able to have this Bible study with him. And it's quite interesting when you um, interact with different people in the in their journey of faith. Um, it's a humility factor when you find someone that's so keen to learn who God is and has no picture of who God is. And it's just so interesting how you have to learn to dial down your words so you don't get them lost. So one of our... Um, I, I spoke, to, I texted him last night, I said, is it all right if I mention him? So Lee and his son Bobby, we've... We've uh, just started Bible studies, and to how would I interpret grace to him? And so I said it like this, because he plays footy, and I've retired from footy, and I said, it's like you, all right? You don't turn up to training for four weeks, and the coach calls you in and goes, you are in the starting lineup for this week. Something you didn't deserve but yet it was given to you as a gift. And he continued on. He goes, oh, can you help me understand this? So, again, trying to understand who he is as an individual and where his journey in life is, we then would go to, um, I won't name these fast food restaurants. So you go to a fast food restaurant, and you're short of change to purchase an item, and they give it to you anyway. They give you extra pieces or extra burgers. Um, and so he gets it, you know. It's quite funny because I, in my head, I'm just like, how do I interpret God's grace to someone who has no picture of who God is? The only picture he knows is through the actions of his father. And Lee, as many of you guys were around at the time, he was baptized here last year in December. Right, Pastor Glenn uh, had the honors of baptizing him. And it's just a momentum, transformational moment. And so when we think about God's grace, one verse comes to mind. And that is, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely. Now, when you see that word freely, it's for free. By his grace, through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. When I sat and talked to these guys regarding this verse and trying to interpret, we had to unpack different words, sin, glory, short, God, justify, freely, grace, redemption, Christ, Jesus. Oh, man, my brain was just, it was going at 100 miles an hour. But I remembered one thing, that it's all the Holy Spirit's work through the transformation of his Father. And so when we think about grace, it is a gift that is given to us. When we accept it, we don't deserve it, but God goes, here, it's yours, take it. If you have your Bibles with me, church family, please turn with me to Genesis 18. We're going to explore an individual that was known as a friend of God, and it was Abraham. And we're going to unpack four points. And in these four points, hopefully you will take home these four points to apply it to your ministry into the communities that each and every one of you um, are involved in. So we're going to, so we're going to read in... Um, I've got, if you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles at the back of the church. Um, so if you want to grab one, there is one there. Um, but I'm going to read, once you have Genesis 18, I want you to turn to the person next to you and go, I got it. Oh, not many of you got it because I can't hear it. <laughs> yeah, sweet as. No, all good, all good. I'll tell you this other, I'll tell you this other great story. Uh, on Fridays, I, I do uh, Bible studies with some of the kids at, at school. And uh, if I am late, so late for me is 8 o'clock. Isn't that right, Sully, Eli? Bailey? Yep. So late for me is 8 o'clock. Now, late for them is 8.01. Okay? So every second after 8 o'clock is one, is it one push-up, boys? One push-up per second I am late. But if they're late for one minute, 
It's only five push-ups. So how many push-ups did I have to do? Yeah, so I was late by 60 seconds. You know what? The boys hold you accountable to it. They will let you know that you are in the wrong. So from their grace, they go, all right, Pastor Grant, you can do 30. And I went, yes, with Solly on your back. I'm not sure where the grace was on that one. Uh, it was just an awesome, it's awesome to go, to walk through, walk through life with the young lads and everyone in our community trying to understand their picture of what God's grace is to us. So as we explore Genesis 18, we're going to read. In verse 1 it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Memoir. While he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Now, point number one is in verse one, is that we need to be flexible when we are a friend or we have chosen to follow God. We need to be flexible. As it reads in verse one, it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Memoir while sitting there at the entrance of the tent at the heat of the day. So, does anyone have any family members that just rock up to your house uninvited? My, my wife, where is she? Is she just keep your hand down, please. Um, do you have any family members like that? We had an incident today, early this morning. We, we had to shift the program. You have to be flexible. Yeah? Because when God turns up, it's not when you're comfortable. It's when you're not ready and you're like, bro, what are you doing? And here, Abraham was the same thing. Abraham, he, the Lord appeared to him. He just rocked up. And it's just like us. Like for me, personally, I, I love to stick to time. Sometimes when you've got two kids, the challenge is real. Right? So my wife knows I get a bit anxious if I'm having to do things at church or any other spaces and that we, if we relate, uh, it, just, it just scratches my back a bit. But being flexible when you have this divine person means that you have to get ready to be uncomfortable. And Abraham here, as we read, the Lord just appeared to him. And remember, was a, is a place, in Genesis 13, was a place... At the time, Lot and Abraham had to separate because they had too many things. They were so wealthy. God had blessed them abundantly. They had to split. So this was a significant place. Even in Genesis 23, when his wife passed away, he went to go a block of land and near the same place. It had a significant place in, in Abraham's journey in the book of Genesis. So first point is being flexible. When God turns up, you need to be flexible. As hard as it is, because as humans, we like to be comfortable. We don't like to be flexible. But as sometimes I call it, it's always in God's time, not in your time. There are things happen. And sometimes that is a hard pill to swallow, particularly when you're going through pain. But whatever God does and wherever God appears or wherever God turns up, it's the right time for you. So here, Abraham, as we, that's point number one, being flexible. We're going to read on in verse two. And it goes, Abraham looked up and saw the three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of the tent to meet them, and he bowed low. Everyone says low. That was a high pitch low. Say low. Low. Thank you. They bowed low to the ground. Right? Our second point is humility. Now, Abraham was a wealthy man. He had, he had been blessed by God. Throughout all the previous chapters in Genesis, he had been blessed and he had so much. He had a lot of servants, a lot of cattle, he had a lot of things. He, didn't, he was still trying to work out who these three men were. But yet he walked, rushed out, and he bowed. Bala shared with us this morning in the welcome 
that God doesn't like the proud, but he likes the humble. And the Beatitudes is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth in Matthew chapter 5. Humility is recognizing who you are, but also recognizing the person or the deity that you are bowing down to. In the original language, when Abraham bowed, it was bow, it was, he was bowing down, bowing down in reverence of that person. Now, when we journey through life itself, life itself, we have this concept of, you know, I, I've worked hard to where I got today, and so for that, therefore it's, it's mine. And trying to, try to bow down to someone else in reverence or submission is quite hard. But here Abraham, having a lot of things, again in Genesis 13 it highlights the abundance of things that him and his nephew had. They had so much things. Yet Abraham went out and he bowed down. And he bowed low, recognizing God and recognizing who he is. That's point number two. Point number three is serving the Lord. So we're going to continue reading on in verses three to eight. And it says, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may wash all your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then you can go on your way now that you have come to your servant. They replied, very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried. Now, previous text, Abraham's 99. Now, the concept of a 99-year-old hurrying, Mm, not sure. But here it says that Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, as we read on in verse 6. Quick, he said, get three shears and fine flour and kneel it, to, kneel it and bake bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice of tender calf. Going on the theme of calves here with uh, the prodigal son. Thank you, Bell. Tend the calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some cuds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under the tree. Sometimes in life, we forget who we are serving. And so we focus on the noise as opposed to focusing on God. In the custom of the day, they were big on hospitality. So for, for the owner or, or um, uh, yeah, the pillar of, of the household going out to offer hospitality, that was a sign of recognition in that culture. Hospitality was big, right? And here we discover that Abraham, at 99 years of age, hurried. Now, just that concept of hurry at 99 is just still basil me. But he hurried because it was part of their custom of the day. And when we think about ministry itself, we look at, in verse 6, it says, So Abraham hurried into the tent. Quick, he said. And he provided the fine flour, baked some bread. He ran to select a choice. He gave the best. He could have just asked his servants to go and get all that. Instead, Abraham did it. Again, we're highlighting these points of Abraham being a friend of God. 
And that in service to the Lord, he remained faithful to who he was serving. He served, he gave generously. And again, I, I highlight the word hurry, and he, he hastened. He was quick. He never had a second thought. He just goes, I'm going to do it. In Genesis 22, when he, um, further on in that book, when he was to, when God gave him instructions to take his promised child to be sacrificed, he rose the early next morning to prepare the donkey. He did not wait. In obedience, he just went. Because he remembered who he was serving, and that's serving the Lord. For us, as Christians, as followers of God, as disciples of Jesus, we too need to remain focused on who we're actually serving. Because when you love what you do, do you ever work a day in your life? <laughs> no. So when you love what you're doing, time is irrelevant. And so here we have Abraham serving his master, serving the Lord. And he served generously and he gave the best. King David, also in 2 Samuel 24, when he was trying to find a plot of a place to build the temple. There was a discussion between the owner of the place and King David. And David wanted to buy it. And he said, nah, take it, king. It's yours. You're doing the work. You're building the altar for God. And David's like, nah, I want it. No, take it for free. No, nah, I'll pay for it. And then David says this in verse 24 of 2 Samuel. He goes, I will not sacrifice to the Lord what cost me nothing. Serving the Lord. Is it easy? Thank you, Merlin. If you love what you do, like I said, have you worked a day in your life? Many of you know we've been on this journey. Uh, it's on my second year of Avondale now, and I've been at this church community for the, for the last two years. You've seen how I've grown, hopefully grown. My kids are growing faster than me. Um, <laughs> But you've seen how things have evolved and developed in space and time. And for those who I spend a bit of time outside of the space, and they know the passion I have for sharing the gift of grace to our community. Sometimes I choose words that are hmm, not for the sanctuary, but it's relevant for their lives. When serving the Lord, if it doesn't cost you anything, it doesn't mean anything to you. Last week, we, we um, sat down in four quadrants, past Andrew, and we were facilitating the best way for our community, our church community, to be a light into our community afar. And so everyone poured their investment of ideas. It was so good because I had the economic ideas and everyone's just throwing in their monies. I was like, yes, good ideas. But when you invest, when you pour time into something, you feel its purpose. You, you feel valued. You feel wanted. So when David said, I don't want, if it doesn't cost me nothing, I won't give it to the Lord. It was just like Abraham when he was trying to buy his plot to bury his wife. And the people that owned the land said, take it. He's like, no, I want to pay for it. Serving the Lord, it's not easy, but it's rewarding. It's very rewarding. But the point I want to leave here with you guys is don't forget who you're serving. You're not serving yourself. You're serving God. And when you serve God, as it says in the book of Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything shall be added unto you. Seek him first. 
Serve him first and everything will be added to you. We look at the life of Abraham, very blessed individual, because he remained faithful to God. Now he had his hiccups, but he knew where to go to because God was always faithful. That's point number three, serving the Lord. Our last point is submitting to the will of God. I want to read uh, in verse 9 to 15. He says, Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said, the Lord, Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abram and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out, my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? In 13, verse 13, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I'll land that question there for you, for our church family here. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I guess it depends on circumstances and where your heart is. Sometimes the challenges can be real. But is anything too hard for the Lord? Here we have, in, verse, in chapter 17, back end of 17, the Lord had appeared to Abraham and says, hey, through your promised heir, you are going to be a great nation. You are going to be the father of many nations. And Sarah will be the mother of many nations. So he just appeared to them in 17, and then he turns up in 18 to follow up that promise to reassure him, reassure them that what I've promised you, it's going to happen. And as we read, when Sarah you know, laughed about it in a way that I'm old now, am I now to have this pleasure? She was more in the mindset of her own physical human state. Was it unbelief? When we look at submitting to the will of God, sometimes the challenges lies ahead of us into what we want to submit to God and what we want to submit to ourselves. And there the challenges lies. And the Lord says here, is anything too hard for the Lord? So when we're submitting to God's will, it's not easy. Serving the Lord, not easy, but rewarding. Humility, bowing down, is it easy? You can figure that out. And, uh, you know, being flexible with time, well... We have all these four, we have these four points. Being flexible, humility, ministry, serving the Lord, and also submitting to God's will. Sarah had that little, you know, chaff about it. But God was faithful to his promises. When we reflect on the life of Jesus, we reflect on these four points. And it says, you know, to be, was Jesus flexible? Throughout all of Scripture, I tell you now that God had been flexible from day one. From the choices we cho- chose to make, He sorted out a plan of salvation for you and me. He had to be very flexible. Even the chosen people of the Israelites, they were like this. 
Some statements in the Bible says that he had to wait till that generation went away for him to be rebuilt a new generation that had faith. Was God flexible? When Jesus walked on this earth, was he flexible? Very flexible. Because we're not perfect beings. I'm not a perfect being. So Jesus had to adapt, had to adjust in order for us to know what salvation looked like. When we talk about humility, so we go back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it says, if we remain faithless, he will remain faithful. He cannot deny himself. So even the time when Sarah coughed, laughed, that doubt, God remained faithful to his promise. And throughout all the scripture, it was the same thing. He remained faithful to Abraham and all his descendants after. Humility. When Jesus walked on the surf, was he, was he humble? Was he humble? Yes. Yes, thank you. I was trying to check that. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 to 28, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> it says, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for ransom for many. Jesus demonstrated that. Even at the Last Supper, he got down on his feet as a rabbi and he washed his disciples' feet. And, and he had one of his disciples, a follower of, a follower of him, who's like, oh, well, you know, don't wash my feet, wash everything else. You know, the funny joker. But Jesus came down to serve. He was to lay down his life for many. When we look at ministry, Jesus never forgot his purpose. His purpose was you and me today. His purpose was for our Central Coast family and afar. And those who are still seeking, belonging, becoming, and believing in God. When Jesus was on earth, he did so many things. You know, his mom asked him, son, can you turn this water into wine? Jesus goes, mom, it's not my time yet. But he had to be flexible. Because if my mom said something, mate, I'd be like, yes, mom, no worries. But even Jesus, Jesus never forgot who he was serving. And he wanted to remind even his own family who he, came, who he was serving. And it's just like us, church family. Do not forget, when you take on the mantra of ministry, and it doesn't mean that you have to be up here. It can be the little things that we do all around our community. It could even start with a smile. Jesus never forgot who he was serving. And when his submission to God's will, in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was heading to the cross. And he spent some time in a place called Gethsemane, where he prayed. But he remembered that he was doing the will of his Father. Here's a clutch moment. Clutch moment, I looked it up on AI. It's a moment in the game where you get the ball, there's three seconds left, a basketball, by the way, or a football. 
whatever ball you want to catch. You get the ball, and there's this clutch moment where you are in the position to finish the game. And you make it. So here's the clutch. When we look back on Genesis 18, in verses 1 and 2, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Memoir, While he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried to the entrance of the tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. The clutch is here. God will never enter your life unless he is invited. He has this gift. He has this grace. He has this mercy. He has this love. Unless he's invited, he's not going to bombard you. He will turn up when he is invited. He will not overstay his welcome, but he is willing to persevere with you through the things of this world. And that's grace. Abraham, the three men were standing there. So I don't know how long they were standing there, but they were standing there. It wasn't until the moment that Abraham went out, that invitation to come in was the moment where grace can work when we accept that and we invite that into our lives. So church family, being flexible, humility, serving the Lord, and submitting to God's will. Let me pray. Dear Lord, our gracious Father, I just want to continuously uplift you in every way possible. May the words spoken today, may they be your words. And may the Holy Spirit use it to transform the lives of our community. The way we think, the way we speak, the way we act. May the things that we do be a blessing and may it bring glory to you, Father. As we walk out of this space into our little discussion groups, Lord, May we continue to grow more about connecting with you, but also growing to learn a better picture of who you are. Thank you, Father, for everything that you've blessed us with. We're so grateful for the joys and the challenges you brought in our lives. And in your timing, everything is perfect. And may we remember that in our, in our walk of life. Humble us in every way, Father. This is our humble prayer. Amen.